afternoon. Thank you for joining us on this beautiful day. It's fitting that we are here in Garrison Theater today, surrounded by the memories of some of Harrison's closest friends. Bob and Catherine Garrison were among his earliest supporters, helping the young artist and his family to settle in Padua Hills and collecting many of his best works over several decades. The building is designed by Millard Sheets, the man who brought Harrison and so many other artists to Claremont. The East Courtyard is named for his mentor, Richard Pedersen, with a mosaic frieze dedicated to Betty Wood, another avid arts supporter. The tapestry and the lobby are designed by his neighbor, Gene Ames, and the benches by his close friend, Sam Maloof. While these artists are gone now, we are lucky to still have them with us in this magnificent building, and many of us still have Harrison in our lives. Perhaps a bowl on a table, a vase on a shelf, or a sculpture scene in an exhibition. Dad once told me, if I could say what I wanted to say with words, I wouldn't be making pots. A bowl can be used for many purposes, and a bottle or a vase can still be used for flowers. However, I thought it would be nice if it could just stand on its own. If you don't have something to put in it, it would have enough strength of character that it would be an object unto itself. Harrison's words. Strength of character, steadfast unto itself. These terms Harrison used to articulate the ideals of his own work could as easily have been used to describe the man himself. An artist with a singular vision and a steadfast dedication to beauty, to refined craftsmanship, to friendship, and to community. His essence, calm, soft-spoken, quiet, unassuming. Because of that, many related to him closely and he almost became ours. We shared part ownership of this dear man. In 1995, when I was at the fair, I set up a crafts exhibit, fine crafts show, and that included Harrison McIntosh. But by that time, Harrison had switched from functional wear to sculpture. His work consisted of abstract forms resembling pods or egg shapes or saucers and they were mounted on polished steel or sometimes on wood blocks. This represented a big shift of, on his work but also a shift in his spiritual vision. For many of us that looked at these forms, they represented tranquility, or even meditation. I became a part of this family in 1965 when I married my lovely wife, Georgiana, niece to Harrison, daughter of his brother, Robert. When Harrison's pots first started appearing in our family, I started hitting them. Easy. You know, I mean, you don't want to break anything. You just hit it with, with a knuckle. To, and when the, when the pot is absolutely pure, as his pots were, they give off a tone. And it was, so I showed him that one day, and I, I can't really explain to you the expression on his face, because nobody had ever done that to one of his pots. So. I was thinking about Harrison last night, and I wrote this. I feel very lucky to have known Harrison. Even when I was a teenager in the 1960s in Pasadena, I recall seeing his work. I remember being attracted to the simple yet classic forms, that blend of Scandinavian and Asian, but I represented Harrison late in his long and very productive career, still wanting, on my part, to have more of his work recognized. 
I presented the late sculpture works in 2005. These were the rounded discs, sculptural spheres, and oval forms mounted on chrome steel bases. The sculptures fulfilled a vision of the late 20th century, no longer tied to pottery traditions, but developed from content and from the themes of unity, peace, and calm. These are themes that had always been present in his work, but now they were given sculptural form. Titles to these forms give greater understanding. Yin and Yang, Nature's Union, and Mass and Space. And the works had a calm, balanced view of man's place in nature. Consider, for example, the form of Raindrop, a meditation on a single drop of water, a source of life. It was the gentle spirit of the man that I will remember. His calm and balanced way of being was reflected in the work. He was dignified, kind, and a very peaceful man, and may he rest in peace. Harry and Rummy shared a studio for 60 years. When I found out that Harry had died, I just thought of something and sent Catherine this note. Dear Catherine, Marianne just sent an email about your great father and his departure. That clarity we felt in his presence, his sure-footedness in the now, is embodied in so many of his pots and objects. Lucky us, really, and wonderfully unfathomable. I sent that, and then my brother Sam, who is not here, obviously, wrote this, and I'm going to close with this. Rupert the Younger, that's me, just said it perfectly. I used to joke with him, me, that the first scene in Star Wars was old Ben Kenobi in the desert hills of Tatooine, and that always reminded me of Padua Hills. I can only imagine the world that Harry and my dad shared. It is as wonderful to me and as noble as the world <laughs> almost made it <laughs> of the Jedi. Full disclosure from Sam, Rummy never cared for Star Wars. Thank you. My dear husband Harrison and I met right here in Claremont Graduate School in January of 1949. We were married as the first couple, actually, in the brand new Catholic Church of Claremont on Berkeley Street in the center of Claremont 65 years ago, on January 12, 1952. I was um, here on a Fulbright from France, from Paris, France, to teach at Pomona College, and I had never done ceramics, but I was interested to go to the graduate school and uh, study ceramics. I had done a lot of sculpture at the Beaux Arts in Paris, and actually, Harrison my, was my private teacher. We had 64 and a half, almost 65 years of the most blissful marriage you could imagine. We traveled a lot. We went to Europe and the Far East in our mutual design for the Mikasa company. We were designing crystal glassware and uh, dinnerware for the Mikasa together. And we did that for about 10 years, traveling in the summer when I was not teaching at the colleges. Our whole life was really created among the artists. And we spent the last 55 years just loving each other and sharing the life of art with the, all of them. And of course, my dear husband had a peaceful life and he died only at the age of 101 years old. And, you know, I think that, in a way, he was a perfect example of the harmony that really inspired the creativity in this town. And I hope that we can continue this in Claremont. I think that we really have to support the art as an important center of, our, of art. The, the ambassador of France told me that Claremont was famous all over Europe as the center of art of the United States. Let's continue that. It is very important. 
and I hope that you can support this atmosphere of creativity, not only among the artists, but among the whole population and the, the fact that we have a marvelous university around us. Thank you very much. I was uh, fortunate beyond words, but not beyond gratitude, uh, to be assigned to the local parish back in the 70s, where I met for the first time Harrison and Marguerite, Catherine, and also Sam Malouf. And I have also the great fortune to have been gifted uh, by Harrison and Marguerite, Catherine, uh, with four pieces. Appropriately, a chalice, and a wonderful wine carafe, and two communion plates, and also a chair by Saint Malouf. Obviously all gifts. In the seminary, we learn philosophy, and uh, as only a philosopher can say, describing what beauty is, it was, I'll give it in translation, that which when seen pleases. That which when seen pleases. In other words, it calls to mind something that fulfills us. That's the great gift of art. The romantic period, John Keats described it, the thing of beauty is a joy forever. Its loveliness increases. It never passes into nothingness. And with that in mind, Harrison's eyesight, we're told, faded, but his vision will remain. As a testament to his vision and ability to see that escapes most of us.